Hi, it's Katrina, Choquequirao, Peru. One of the most remote Inca ruins in the Peruvian Andes, Choquequirao is not as famous as Machu Picchu, but it is just as stunning. It's known as the lonely Machu Picchu since it is one of the more remote Incan ruins. At the site, an intricate display of Inca stairways and terraces are cut into this deep jungle above the Apurimac River. 100 miles west of Cusco, the ruins, believed to have been a royal estate for Inca nobility, were built a few generations before the Spanish arrived in the area. With a plaza, ceremony and meeting halls, and stairways flanked by irrigation channels, the settlement located within the mountainous terrain is surrounded by jungle on either side. Over the last 20 years, ruins have been uncovered in Choquequirao, whose name means cradle of gold. The archaeological complex is located at the foot of Mount Salcante, a two-day mule ride from the nearest road. Known as the Sacred Sister of Machu Picchu, the complex is being recovered by the Peruvian government as an alternate destination for tourists traveling to Peru. Have you ever been to Machu Picchu? Would you like to? Let me know in the comments below! Presumed to have been a cultural religious center for the Inca Empire, some believe it was once a checkpoint for those coming into the area because it connected the jungle complex to other religious centers. Various species adapted to the different temperatures at Choquequirao, including Indian deer, chinchillas, hummingbirds, and spectacled bears. Giant ferns and a variety of orchids make it a magical place to visit. Located 10,000 feet above sea level and 5,000 feet above the roaring waters of the river below, with snow-capped peaks surrounding the site, makes it easy to see why the Inca used it as a ceremonial center that was dedicated to the worship of mountain gods, the river, and the elements of nature. For a long time, Choquequirao was so remote that it was shrouded in mystery. With its complex terrace system, ritual places dedicated to the sun, ancestors, earth, water, and other divinities, it serves as an equally important ancient site when compared to Machu Picchu. Tombs of the Nobles, Egypt The Valley of the Kings in Egypt is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world and where King Tut was found. But have you heard of the Tombs of the Nobles? Similar to other sites from ancient Egypt, the necropolis has hundreds of rock-cut tombs dedicated to high-ranking Egyptian nobles. Many of the tombs date back as much as 3,800 years, with statues, paintings, and hieroglyphics decorating them. While most tourists flock to the tombs of the pharaohs, a trip to these tombs offer an exclusive look at a cluster of tombs built into a rocky hillside without much pomp and circumstance. But that doesn't take away from the importance of this site as it is dedicated to various governors, administrators, and other minor figures who helped to keep the inner workings of the ancient culture run smoothly. Discovered in 1885 by a British archaeologist named Lord Grenville, the site houses a long list of notable residents from the Old and Middle Kingdom. To the average history buff, though, the names may not be as famous as Akhenaten, Nefertiti, or Tutankhamun, but the residents, including a mayor of Thebes, a scribe to Hatshepsut and Thutmose III, and other scribes and stewards also demonstrate the wealth and life of those who served the pharaohs closely. The tombs of the nobles are an equally important piece of the puzzle that makes up ancient Egypt. Vatican Necropolis Hidden beneath St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, an astounding collection of sculpture, art, woodworking, and reliquaries detail the storied past of ancient Romans. Spanning 2,000 years of history, the preserved artifacts represent six different historical periods. The Vatican necropolis goes down three levels beneath the street surface to a 1st century AD pagan burial ground. The second level, a 5th century pagan and Christian burial ground with mausoleums and other rooms, contribute to the staggering collection of artifacts that account for nearly 90% span of the Roman Empire. Within the necropolis, a small earthen mound is lit and cordoned off from the others. Inside, it is said to hold the bones of St. Peter, as well as the rock that the original church was first built with. Pope Pius XI requested the archaeological excavation so he could be buried as closely as possible to St. Peter. Located north of the city center in Rome, Vatican City is about one-eighth the size of Central Park in New York. Rich in culture and religious history, people around the globe visit Vatican City to not only be surrounded in its cultural history, but also to catch a glimpse of the Pope himself. The Vatican necropolis is not the same as the Vatican grottos. Located five floors down below the most visited church in the world, the necropolis is one of the best-kept secrets of the Vatican. To preserve the delicacy of the archaeological artifacts from decay, visits are limited to small groups who wish to see the pagan burial grounds, the stone mausoleums, the tomb of St. Peter the Apostle, and the other important items of religious history. Have you been to the Vatican? Did you visit the necropolis? Let me know in the comments below! Bagan, Myanmar 
From the 9th to 13th centuries, the ancient city of Bagan was the political, economic, and cultural center of the pagan empire. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, the wealthy rulers commissioned thousands of temples to be built, with over 10,000 Buddhist temples, pagodas, and monasteries when standing on this 100-square-kilometer plain in central Myanmar. Today, the remains of over 2,200 temples, pagodas, and monasteries are still present. Built over the course of 250 years, the prosperous city grew and soon became a cosmopolitan center for religious studies. Monks and scholars from as far away as India came to study there, but when the Mongols invaded the area, they sacked the kingdom and the golden age of Bagan ended. Although the village was reduced to ruins, religious monuments continued to be built up to the mid-15th century. People still continue to visit the area as a pilgrimage, but most only visit the most prominent temples. Many of the less famous, out-of-the-way temples fell into disrepair, and others were damaged by natural disasters such as earthquakes. Today, only a few dozen temples are kept up. In the 1990s, the government began to restore some of the damaged pagodas, but more modern materials were used instead of trying to retain the original architectural style. Because of the government's irresponsible actions, UNESCO rejected the city as a World Heritage Site, since many of the temples were restored without sticking to historic methods. Despite that, visitors continue to travel to the area to see the hundreds of ruined temples and get a glimpse into the past of the Bagan culture. Ani, Turkey Located on a secluded plateau of northeast Turkey, the archaeological site of Ani features residential, religious, and military structures of the city that once flourished in the 10th and 11th centuries. The capital of the Armenian kingdom of the Bagratides, Ani later became an important crossroads for merchant caravans, but both a Mongol invasion and a devastating earthquake in 1319 were the beginning of the city's decline. Located on a plateau overlooking a ravine that forms the natural border with Armenia, Ani has been inhabited since the Bronze Age. The property has three different zones, including the citadel with the ruins of multiple churches, the outer citadel or walled city with temples, cathedrals, and a market, and the area outside the city walls with rock-carved structures located on the slopes of one of the local valleys. There are also a number of religious monuments from Christian, Muslim, and Zoroastrian denominations. The architectural design reflects the various peoples who met there, including Armenians, Georgian, and Islamic cultures. It also displays the Armenian culture with techniques and styles unique to its people. The medieval architecture of its military, religious, and civil buildings is a unique combination that offsets the tunnels and caves located beneath the plateau. Located across the Carrion River from Armenia, the crumbling metropolis known as the City of 1001 Churches was founded more than 1600 years ago. Despite being conquered hundreds of times, this ancient city and its impressive ruins offer a glimpse at a once great site and its importance to the Armenian people people. Prasat Muang Singh, Thailand In western Thailand, near the Myanmar border, an outpost of crumbling city walls lingers. Prasat Muang Singh, a group of ancient Thai temples, were originally built between the 12th and 13th centuries. Now they lay hidden in thick jungle undergrowth. Uncovered about 50 years ago, the temples consist of four monuments as well as a set of prehistoric burial sites with a main building complex, smaller complex that is mostly destroyed, and ruins of two smaller ancient buildings, Prasat Muang Singh is a 50-kilometer drive from the city of Kanchanaburi. Similar to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, Prasat Muang Singh acted as a stronghold to protect the kingdom from the invasion from the west. Within the complex, there are four monuments, with a main building complex that features walls, gates, and an impressive bodhisattva statue. A smaller building complex, mostly ruined over time, and two smaller ancient buildings, also in ruins, make up the rest of the site. Separate from the temples is an area of prehistoric burials, proving that the area has been inhabited for centuries. Set amongst vast forests and river kwai running past it, Prasat Muang Singh is a spectacular hidden gem that still shows some of the beauty of this fallen civilization. Pella, Jordan Inhabited as early as 5000 BC, the ancient city of Pella prospered during the Greco-Roman period. Placed at the crossroads of numerous trading routes that linked Europe to the Near East and Asia, the city flourished with trade and was influenced by the diverse cultures who visited there. Later coming under the rule of the Ptolemies, disaster struck Pella in 83 BC when the leader of Judeo destroyed the city when its inhabitants refused to embrace Judaism. During the Byzantine era, Pella was revitalized when trade routes strengthened and industry developed. It is believed that 25,000 people lived in or near Pella during the late 5th century. But as various armies took control and a great earthquake destroyed much of the city, it was later abandoned for five centuries. Now, a team of American and Australian archaeologists continue to unearth its treasures. 
the remnants of a church as well as an immense water tank, ruins of houses, shops, and other city buildings have also been located. The ruins of a large Byzantine church that was built in the 6th and 7th centuries as well as Roman baths have also been found. As archaeologists continue to explore, the hope that they may find remains of early Christians at the ancient site continues. A cave complex located a short distance from the main mound could possibly hold antiquities of Pella's original inhabitants. Scara Bray, Ireland Known as one of Orkney's most visited ancient sites, the village of Scarabray is considered one of the most remarkable prehistoric monuments in Europe. Discovered in the late 1800s after exceptionally high tides during a storm unearthed its ruins, the village was saved from obscurity. Ancient stone-built structures originally used by local fishermen were uncovered by a local laird, who excavated and revealed four houses that were dated back to the Iron Age. Over the years, various excavations have taken place at the site with numerous artifacts being uncovered, but determining the age of them was a bit of a challenge. It wasn't until the 1970s when further excavations were undertaken by the National Museums of Scotland that enough material that was suitable for radiocarbon dating was uncovered. Researchers found that the site was in fact Neolithic and that it originally stood some distance from the sea. The two cliffs on either side of the bay were once joined together and formed a barrier to protect the site. Two villages have been uncovered on the site and they are believed to have been used for about 600 years. The earlier houses were built on a lower level than the later houses, and modern visitors can get a bird's eye view of the different structures from above. Researchers discovered that the original village was dismantled and the site partially leveled to build the new village. Despite the differences, both sets of houses were laid out roughly the same way, with the hearth in the center and stone blocks for seats. Linked by a subterranean passageway, the houses were connected so inhabitants could move from house to house without having to go outside. But these ancient structures were not the only things that were found here. The skeletons of two women were buried under one of the houses, but it is not clear if they were dead when they were put there or if they were sacrificed. With other innovations such as indoor drains and cells used to store goods, including a cache of bone beads, Scarabray is a remarkable village that was later abandoned and buried over time under a layer of fine sand. If not for the vicious storm, this ancient site may never have been uncovered. Garial, Sometimes called the fish-eating crocodile or the gavial, the garial is an Asian freshwater crocodilian species with a distinctive, long, thin snout. It lives in rivers and spends little time on land, typically only leaving the water to sunbathe, which helps these cold-blooded reptiles to regulate their body temperature or to nest. Today, garials are only found in parts of India and Nepal, although their range once extended from Pakistan to Myanmar, according to National Geographic. On average, these huge crocodiles grow between between 12 and 15 feet long and weigh up to 2,000 pounds. Males possess a distinctive appendage on their snout called a gara, the Hindu word for mud spot. They use this growth for mating displays, including vocalizing and blowing bubbles in the water. Since the 1940s, the garial population has declined by roughly 98 percent, and the species is consequently listed as critically endangered. Like most threatened species on today's list, human activities are largely responsible for driving this unique creature to the brink of extinction. Overhunting, particularly for traditional medicine, and habitat changes, including the redirecting of rivers, are primary causal factors of the species' dramatically reduced presence. Fishing is also a problem, leading to many juvenile garials being caught in nets and drowned. To reduce poaching and hopefully restore the garial population, the Indian government extended full protection to the species during the 1970s. In following decades, captive breeding programs in India and Nepal led to 6,000 specimens being released into the wild, but it's unknown if or how successful these programs were due to a lack of oversight. Roti Island Snake-Necked Turtle The critically endangered Roti Island Snake-Necked Turtle is known for its uniquely long neck, which prevents the turtle from directly withdrawing its head into its shell, instead folding its neck sideways. Native to the Indonesian island of Roti, the species can also be found in Australia, New Guinea, and East Timor. This creature is among the world's 15 most threatened turtle species. Species. The creature is still hunted for food, but the main perpetuating factor of its impending demise is the international exotic pet trade. Additionally, there are only three breeding populations on Roti, and their habitat is extremely limited, occupying just 27 square miles. People will pay a high price to have their very own Roti Island snake neck turtle, but the species itself will pay the ultimate price, in the form of its existence being wiped off the map if conservation efforts are unsuccessful. There are captive breeding programs, but 
but increased oversight and efforts against the illegal wildlife trade are also necessary. The alarming decline of this fascinating creature also calls attention to the dire need for consumers to make informed and responsible purchasing decisions, especially when it comes to the exotic pet trade. A little bit of education can go a long way for true animal lovers, who would undoubtedly choose to preserve their favorite species by leaving them in the wild where they belong, and by refusing to spend money on the harmful practice of bringing an endangered specimen into captivity and supporting wildlife traffickers. Armadillo Lizard This little guy is actually real! The armadillo lizard is a terrestrial lizard species that gets its name from its tendency to curl into a ball in a defensive position, just like an armadillo. It will stay like this for about an hour if it has to, to protect its delicate belly and other body parts from harm. But this creature, which is native to South Africa, is fascinating for reasons beyond its unique armor. For one, armadillo lizards are viviparous, meaning they are among the few reptile species who do not lay eggs, and instead give live birth. They are also insectivores, who feed primarily on termites and require very little food to survive. Despite its somewhat intimidating appearance, this slow-moving species has an oddly docile demeanor, except during mating season when males become uncharacteristically territorial. Their overall calm and gentle attitude, however, makes armadillo lizards vulnerable to other creatures, particularly humans. Armadillo lizards are threatened due to both their uniqueness and because they're relatively easy to catch, making them a popular exotic pet. Consequently, they are profitable, and therefore attractive to illegal wildlife traffickers. Unfortunately for pet owners, many of whom undoubtedly mean well, the ugly truth to keeping armadillo lizards in captivity is that it's actually harmful for the species as a whole, and buying one may very well help support smuggling and other crimes. The lesson? It's best for these fascinating creatures to admire them from a distance and to discourage the illegal animal trade. Leatherback Sea Turtle Named for the texture of its shell, the leatherback sea turtle is the world's largest turtle, and they are super huge! Way bigger than I thought, with front flippers measuring up to 8.9 feet. It's also the last surviving member of both the Dermochelys genus and the Dermochelidae family. Unlike most other modern sea turtles, the leatherback sea turtle lacks a bony shell and has a carapace that is covered by skin and oily flesh. If you see them in the water, they are one of the most beautiful and graceful creatures you'll ever encounter, but the giant leatherback sea turtle hides a secret that you'll rarely see – its terrifying mouth and throat. It's the largest species of turtle and the third largest reptile in the world, so it needs to eat a lot to survive. They have hundreds of giant spikes, known as papillae, that line the turtle's throat all the way down to its gut. This species is highly migratory, crossing both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and has a wide distribution, but is listed as vulnerable on the International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List. Some populations populations are considered critically endangered. The leatherback sea turtle's numbers have reduced dramatically over the last century, mainly due to egg collection and from ending up as bycatch in fishing nets. Plastic pollution also has a devastating effect on sea turtle populations in general. An estimated 52% of the world's sea turtles have ingested plastic waste that is floating around in the world's oceans, mistaking things like plastic bags for their favorite foods like jellyfish, algae, or other creatures that turtles eat. Eating plastic can lead to death by causing intestinal blockages and rupturing internal organs. Turtles also sometimes become entangled in plastic waste, including discarded and abandoned fishing nets, and drown or are unable to escape predators as a result. Baby sea turtles are also threatened by plastic, which accumulates along nesting beaches and blocks their path to the ocean. The bottom line is that in order to save the leatherback and other sea turtle species from inevitable extinction, the world's citizens and governments must take a firmer stance against plastic pollution and must work harder to develop and use more or environmentally friendly materials. Psychedelic Rock Gecko There are only an estimated 500 adult psychedelic rock geckos left in the wild, and they are only found on the tiny Vietnamese island of Han Khoai. These extremely rare lizards are threatened primarily by habitat loss and predation, mainly by the invasive long-tailed macaque, according to Australian Geographic contributor Beck Crew. Much like the armadillo lizard, the psychedelic rock gecko is also a victim of the exotic pet trade, and this harmful trafficking further endangers the species. It's easy to see by taking just one look at the creature, why people are so drawn to it. After all, there is a reason the species has the word psychedelic in its name. The psychedelic rock gecko's neck and head are covered in splashes of daffodil yellow, while its lavender body, which almost looks like it's lit up from within, is accented with a bright orange tail, belly, and feet. The animal also appears to wear bright green eye shadow due to the vivid markings right above its eyes. Sadly, in the mere decades since scientists first discovered the psychedelic rock
rock gecko, its population has already dwindled to near nothing. Since 2013, trappers and smugglers have made the species readily available in Europe for as much as $3,400 per pair. Despite the creature's black market value, the little studied species remains rather enigmatic to scientists. Researchers have established some known facts about the psychedelic rock gecko, however, which qualify it as unique in various ways. For one, unlike most other Southeast Asian geckos, both males and females, and even immature specimens, bear the same coloring and patterns. The species also does not utilize any camouflaging abilities it may or may not have, instead choosing to openly sunbathe rather than conceal itself among foliage and other elements of its surroundings. However beautiful this creature may be, it's too bad that the psychedelic rock gecko does not blend in better with its environment. Perhaps it would be more difficult for wildlife traffickers to catch and smuggle. Mary River Turtle or the Punk Turtle The Mary River Turtle is perhaps the most unique looking turtle out there. Nicknamed the Punk Turtle for its bright green mohawk, this distinctive creature is endemic to Queensland, Australia's Mary River. This ancient species diverged from all other living turtles around 40 million years ago, long before humans split from other primates, roughly 10 million years ago. Shockingly, the Mary River turtle was kept captive as a pet for over two decades before scientists formally described it as a species. Since the 1970s, its population rapidly declined, earning the species the IUCN Red List classification of endangered. The Mary River turtle is threatened by the lengthy amount of time it takes for specimens to reach sexual maturity, with most only starting to breed at around 25 years old. The building of dams in the creature's natural habitat and its popularity as a pet prevent the species from breeding, but conservation programs hope to turn its bleak numbers around in coming years. Earless Monitor Lizard The earless monitor lizard's scientific name, Lanthanotus borneensis, literally translates to found in Borneo, and that's because it was in 1877. Between then and in recent years, less than 100 specimens were captured by scientists and collectors. That all changed starting in 2008, when a research team commissioned by an oil palm company surveyed a dense area of jungle in Indonesian Borneo. Their job was to identify any environmental and or cultural factors that may be adversely affected if the area were converted into a plantation, and the earless monitor lizard was their most noteworthy find. Before even realizing that they had stumbled upon such a valuable and rare specimen, the group eagerly interacted with the uniquely gentle, foot-long brown and yellow creature, which had pronounced scales, a snake-like body, and a dragon-like cartoonish face, Rachel Neuer reported in a 2019 Wired article. The researchers published the details of their incredible discovery in 2012, craftily omitting any identifying information about exactly where they found the lizard, or so they thought, in hopes of preventing exotic pet traffickers and collectors from tracking down and capturing the elusive creature. But determined reptile enthusiasts and those looking to profit from the trade, figured out where to find the earless monitor lizard based on the limited information that was released. And soon enough, these rare creatures flooded into the classifieds and began appearing in people's reptile collections. This served as a sobering reminder to the scientific community that even though it's important to share information about endangered species with fellow researchers, wildlife collectors and smugglers are relentless in their pursuits for lucrative exotic specimens. Unfortunately, situations like this beg the question of whether it's necessary to keep some information out of public hands. At the same time, establishing easily available field data is necessary necessary for preserving threatened species. So what's the solution to this quandary? Scientists are still trying to figure that out. Meanwhile, the earless monitor lizard and other threatened and rare species are becoming even more endangered at the hands of the exotic pet trade. What do you think scientists should do? Let me know in the comments below. Abingdon Island Giant Tortoise Officially the world's rarest reptile, according to Guinness World Records, the Abingdon Island Giant Tortoise, a subspecies of the also incredibly rare Galapagos Giant Tortoise, was until relatively recently represented by a single known specimen nicknamed Lonesome George. They, or he, was also known as the Pinta Giant Tortoise. Despite being the current record holder for the title of the world's rarest reptile, George unfortunately passed away in 2012, at over 100 years old. But even before then, experts had little to no hope that this giant tortoise would carry on after George passed away, so they already considered the subspecies to be effectively extinct despite the remaining lone survivor. Interestingly, George wasn't only considered lonesome because he was the last known member of his subspecies, but also due to his apparent aversion to female tortoises. Once upon a time, the Galapagos Islands contained thousands of giant tortoises encompassed by around 15 subspecies. Those days are long gone, 
courtesy of human activity during the 18th and 19th century, which saw many, if not most, of the giant tortoise populations in the Galapagos archipelago hunted nearly to extinction. As a result, scientists and conservationists are scrambling against the clock to save the few remaining subspecies from disappearing completely. Round Island Keel-Scaled Boa The Round Island Keel-Scaled Boa is the last surviving member of the Boliridae family, and it's also not a true boa. In fact, the species diverged from all other snakes around 65 million years ago, right before the dinosaurs went extinct. It has the distinction of being the only terrestrial vertebrate with a special joint in its upper jaw that can separate the anterior and posterior bones. This nocturnal snake also changes colors gradually over a 24-hour time span, turning dark during the daytime when it's inactive and becoming lighter at night. There was once a round island keel-scaled boa population present on mainland Mauritius and other surrounding islands, but humans introduced invasive species such as rats and pigs, which then depleted the snake's presence everywhere except Round Island, the only island which remained rodent-free, thereby acting as a de facto sanctuary for the serpents. Other animals, like rabbits and goats, contributed to the creature's demise by destroying its habitat, thanks to a rehabilitation program which removed grazing animals from Round Island and seeks to restore the snake's population the Round Island keel-scaled boa's numbers are increasing. The snake was even reintroduced to the nearby island of Gunners Quan. Stone Circles of Senegal and Gambia There are four massive stone structures spread over thousands of miles throughout Senegal and Gambia in West Africa, which are called the Stone Circles, or the Senegambian Stone Circles. Dating back to roughly 300 BC, the constructions are accompanied by evidence of ancient communities, including 17,000 monuments, 2,000 home sites, and numerous graves. Based on the amount of labor required to build these structures, these ancient communities once made up a very organized and prosperous society, according to Brand South Africa, a website dedicated to crafting a compelling and historically accurate image of Southern Africa and other parts of the continent. The four areas with these standing stones are a UNESCO World Heritage Site and are believed to have outstanding universal values, representing a traditional monumental megalithic construction. Experts believe the stone circles appear to be deliberately arranged, probably for religious or communal reasons. Sourcing the materials and building the monuments would have required specialized knowledge of the laterite stone they are made from, as well as advanced toolwork. It consists of 52 stone circles, as well as one double stone circle and 1,102 carved stones. It is here that archaeologists found layered evidence in the ground of roughly 700 years of community activity, as well as quarries and evidence of iron smelting. The goal is to protect these sites with government support and to make the sites visible and accessible to the public. Earliest Human Facial Piercing Early this year, scientists announced the discovery of the first known facial piercing in a human, which they found while examining a 12,000-year-old skeleton from Tanzania. The man's remains were originally discovered in 1913, but researchers didn't notice his facial piercings until far more recently. Archaeologists from the University of Coimbra in Portugal came to this realization by re-examining the deceased man's teeth, which at first had appeared to be deliberately filed down. It was this second look that helped them see that the individual's teeth were more likely worn down from objects scraping against them, meaning that his cheeks and lip were probably pierced. While it's unknown what his jewelry was made from, it was rather large, at least one inch wide. Body modification is popular today and has a lengthy past, but experts are unsure how far back the practice goes. The discovery of the millennia-old pierced skull is the earliest evidence they've found of it so far, but body modification could have gotten an even earlier start than that, because piercings typically only leave marks on soft tissue that deteriorates after someone passes away, like skin and muscle. So it's hard to say when people started adorning themselves in this way. Before this, recent studies set the date back to at least 12,000 years ago. The previous earliest evidence of piercings was from around 10,000 years ago and was found at archaeological sites in modern-day Sudan. Great Zimbabwe Stone Houses the Great Zimbabwe Stone Houses are a collection of three stone compounds that make up the ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. Perhaps the most perplexing aspect of them is the fact that they were constructed using advanced masonry and building methods that were not found in any of the surrounding areas at the time of construction, starting around 900 years ago. More particularly, these structures were made without the use of mortar. 
Great Zimbabwe flourished between the 10th and 15th centuries, and its stone structures contained equally impressive enclosures, with walls as tall as 36 feet. It took around 300 years to build the city, which contained around 18,000 residents at its peak. The first known written records of Great Zimbabwe date back to sometime during the 16th century, long after the city was abandoned. While it's unknown why residents fled, experts speculate that the depletion of nearby gold mines may have triggered the exodus. But researchers are admittedly still learning about Great Zimbabwe, as much of the site remains unexcavated. In fact, in 2016, a team of scientists estimated that only around 2% of the 1,780-acre city has been unearthed. Evidence thus far indicates that people inhabited different parts of the city at different times, and that the sophisticated society was a monarchy with its own religion. Moreover, the purpose or purposes of the great stone buildings are a source of debate among archaeologists. Regardless of the unknown, the impressive city is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a national symbol for the country of Zimbabwe. Lalibela Churches As Christianity became increasingly popular throughout parts of Africa during the 12th century, more churches were needed to accommodate the burgeoning number of worshippers. A complex containing 11 such structures, known as the Lalibela Churches, were carved out of rock in the mountains of Ethiopia during this time of growth which was also during the Zagwe dynasty. The churches are situated in two main groups and are connected by a complex system of trenches, drainage ditches, and ceremonial passages, some of which lead to mysterious hermit caves and catacombs. While most of the churches were probably used as such from their construction onward, two of the buildings may have served as royal residences, according to UNESCO. One of the churches, Biete Midhani Alem, is believed to be the world's largest monolithic church. Beyond their use for traditional worship, these monolithic cave churches also served as a pilgrimage destination for early African Christians who were unable to travel to Jerusalem. It is here, in this complex that was designed to resemble parts of Jerusalem, earning it the reputation of a so-called New Jerusalem, that the devout pay their homage to King Solomon. The Lalibela churches, which were carved out of volcanic basalt, vary in size and are decorated with Christian imagery, representing a rare and important example of early Christian architecture in Africa. Today, the rock-hewn structures remain a popular pilgrimage destination for the devout, and they are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Lost City of Meroe Located in the East African country of Sudan, along the eastern bank of the Nile River, are the ruins of an ancient city called Meroe. Dating back to around 800 BC, the site constitutes one of Africa's most significant archaeological discoveries. This city was once a prominent trading post, embracing a sophisticated Egyptian culture and filled with palaces, pyramids, and iron production facilities, owing to its rich iron deposits and fertile soil. Meroe was a healthy metropolis of the ancient kingdom of Kush in what is now the Republic of Sudan. Kush was an ancient kingdom in Nubia, and they were major rivals to Egypt at one point. The many pyramids and works of art left behind are testament to the greatness of Nubian kings and queens. Despite how little known the ancient metropolis remains today, Meroe was well known to great societies of the time, including in Rome, Greece, and Persia. And some archaeologists theorize that the city also traded with early Indian and Chinese explorers. Meroe is even mentioned in the Book of Genesis under the name Ethiopia, which describes it as a prominent yet vulnerable center of commerce one which even raised and exported elephants for warfare. The problem is, for over seven centuries, the city was a prime target for invading forces. Over time, signs of Meroe's Egyptian influence faded, and its residents developed their own language, customs, and religion. Unfortunately, however, all those unique cultural facets were lost around 330 AD, when Meroe was permanently and completely destroyed. In 1821, archaeologists rediscovered the lost city, which had lain untouched since its destruction, and excavated around 200 of Meroe's unique Nubian pyramids. They also found evidence of the Meroitic written language, which went extinct around 400 AD and remains undeciphered to this day. National Geographic reports that one of the most remarkable features of the Meroitic civilization was its strong queens. One signed a peace treaty with Emperor Augustus from Rome, and the royal pyramids and burial chambers are full of remarkable treasures. Lady of Mali While some researchers claim this is nothing but a naturally formed chunk of rock, others believe that the Lady of Mali is a gigantic carving of a woman's face and figure. Some say that the Soninke of the Wagadu Empire could have carved the lady some 12,000 years ago. 
Also known as the White Lady of Africa, the formation is located on Mount Laura in northern Guinea, near the Senegal and Mali borders, where it sits at an altitude of over 10,000 feet. Nobody, including those who believe it is man-made, seems to know who supposedly carved it or when. Although estimates put the structure at an age somewhere between 5,000 and 25,000 years old. Reportedly discovered in 1997 by a quote-unquote geologist from Italy named Angelo Pitoni, with an obscure background and questionable credentials, he found it while looking for diamonds. The Lady of Mali is nicknamed the White Lady of Africa due to its, or her, Caucasian features, which are unusual for the area in which she's found. Pitoni somehow connected the formation with the lost civilization of Atlantis, which most mainstream scholars believe was fictional. Pitoni also claimed to find blue stones, or stones of the sky, synthetic stones that were left behind by some advanced ancient civilization. Experts also argue that the structure is not man-made at all, but a natural formation playing tricks on us because of its similarity to a woman's bust. What do you think? Is the Lady of Mali a carving left behind by an ancient civilization? Or is it a natural formation? Let me know in the comments below. Bakoni Ruins One of the world's biggest unsolved archaeological mysteries, known as the Bakoni Ruins, can be found in the hills near the South African town of Machadodorp, which is located in the country's Mpumalanga province. Made up of a collection of complex stone terraces, this reputed lost city dates back over 200,000 years, around the time when the first modern humans are thought to have evolved. The structures are accompanied by evidence of fields, roads, and settlements, and the site bears signs of technological and agricultural technology. Stone walls at the site suggest that the Bakoni tribe retained pasture animals, such as sheep and cattle. As if the existence of such early, sophisticated innovation wasn't fascinating enough, this site's most prominent feature is Adam's Calendar, a 98-foot stone circle containing monoliths within its walls, which are aligned to match the movement of the Orion's Belt constellation. All signs point toward Adam's Calendar being one of the earliest known, if not the oldest, monuments, indicating that ancient peoples charted and kept track of time. The complexity and uniqueness of the ruins, which are interconnected over several hundred kilometers via vast mazes and passages, are especially evident from a bird's eye view. It must have taken quite some time to build these structures, and their proven age suggests to archaeologists that the Bakoni tribe may have been around much longer than the constructions themselves. Pseudo-archaeologists and pseudo-scientists have latched onto conspiracy theories revolving around the site, of course they have, claiming that an ancient alien civilization may have built the Bakoni ruins. But the experts, and arguably any rational thinker, wouldn't think twice about crediting our early relatives for their intellect and hard work. Why not believe in the intelligence of our ancient ancestors? Oldest Tsunami Victims this also comes from Tanzania, more specifically along the banks of the Pangani River. It was there, a few miles inland from the Indian Ocean, that a Swahili village once thrived around 1,000 years ago, until one day, an earthquake-triggered tsunami swept through, wiping everything in its path out of existence. The entire village, including its wooden lattice houses, fishing nets, and shell bead jewelry was no longer. With no time to escape the barreling flood, the villagers themselves also tragically perished. A study published in May of this year asserts that the site contains the oldest known human remains within a tsunami deposit ever found in East Africa. While that is remarkable, the oldest tsunami deposit in the world that was ever found to contain human remains dates back 7,000 years and was discovered in Papua New Guinea, which is located across the Indian Ocean just north of Australia. This more recent discovery adds valuable information to researchers' quest to better understand Indian Ocean tsunamis and their history. Although tsunamis in the region are relatively infrequent, roughly once every 300 to 1,000 years, according to National Geographic, it's imperative for experts to learn more about them, as Tanzania's coastal city of Dar es Salaam is rapidly growing, with a projected population of at least 10 million by the year 2030. Protecting this burgeoning population and preventing a repeat of the fate suffered by the Swahili villagers 1,000 years ago is of utmost importance. Believe it or not, the tsunami that eradicated the village was not major, but it still had catastrophic results because the residents lived on low land. Ancient Pandemics The ongoing global coronavirus pandemic has drawn widespread attention to how modern science and medicine manage disease. It has also sparked a popular fascination with how past pandemics started and how past societies and governments handled rapidly spreading illnesses. As current events show, viruses are scary, and they have the power to dramatically and perhaps permanently alter human civilization. 
An article published in The Conversation in May of this year discusses some of these changes throughout ancient Africa, which are evidenced through archaeological discoveries. Written by Shadrach Chirikure, a professor of archaeology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, the article first mentions that during the early 14th century AD, settlements in the farming town of Akro Croa in the West African country of Ghana experienced a mass abandonment, suggesting that the inhabitants were fleeing illness, quite possibly the Black Death which was sweeping across Europe, Asia, and North Africa at the time. In another example Chirikori mentions, 76 infant burials were unearthed at the Mapungubwe World Heritage Site in South Africa's Limpopo Valley, indicating that a pandemic may have hit the area sometime after the 11th century. So, how did past societies address pandemics besides by abandoning their settlements? After all, as the spread of COVID-19 shows, you can't run from a rampant virus forever because chances are it will eventually probably follow. While relocating settlements was probably a top survival method of choice, communities also burned their villages as a believed disinfection strategy. They also resorted to a less drastic and still practiced method of avoiding the spread of disease, social distancing. It turns out that this common sense way of avoiding sickness dates back to our ancestors. Tried and true, social distancing proves that even in modern times, with the advent of vaccines and advanced medicine, mixing old strategies with new technologies is a surprisingly effective approach. Archaeological evidence in some places throughout Africa, including at Mwenezi in southern Zimbabwe, also indicates that people avoided touching or going near the dead, sometimes to the point where doing so was considered taboo. It's very likely that this belief stemmed from negative consequences associated with interacting with human remains, quite possibly the suffering of deadly illnesses. Sharks World War II was not a battle of man versus man alone. In fact, men aboard the USS Indianapolis also faced the worst shark attack in history. When a Japanese submarine sunk the Indianapolis, 900 men survived the fall into the water. The sound of explosions, splashing, injuries, and overall panic drew sharks in from afar. For days upon days, the sharks fed until only 317 men remained. Researchers estimate a couple dozen to 150 men died from the shark attacks and not from their injuries. There are several documentaries about this terrifying event where the men floated holding on to each other not knowing who the sharks were going to grab next. No doubt the fear of sharks is rampant for beachgoers around the world. No one wants to go out for a relaxing swim only to see a great white staring them down. While people are pretty much more afraid of sharks than anything else in the world, sharks are responsible for about 82 confirmed unprovoked attacks annually. The annual global average for fatalities is about four per year. However, of course, they are still deadly. You don't want one coming after you. Great whites can be up to 20 feet long, their jaws are incredibly strong, and their rows of serrated teeth are well suited to tearing flesh apart but it's actually not really the shark you need to worry about. While great whites are the most famous, the bull shark is believed to be the most dangerous shark of all. In any case, if you see a shark, it's unlikely that you'll be able to swim away fast enough. Given that you would encounter a shark while underwater, you may not be sure how to react, but the best thing to do is avoid panicking. If there is nowhere to go, don't splash around a lot or get panicked because then you will really get the shark's attention. Most of the time, they are just curious. But if you can, place your back against something solid. If there is anything around that you can use as a weapon, try to use it. If it comes close or tries to take an exploratory bite, then it is time to fight. Try going for its gills or its eyes using your hands like claws. Keep doing it until hopefully the shark lets you go. Gorilla In 2017, three tourists in Rwanda were in for a big surprise when a big silverback gorilla shoved two of them onto the ground, causing them to tumble down a hill. The guide grabbed one of the men's arms and also fell to the ground, while the gorilla made a mock charge. It took the guide's level-headed interaction skills to calm it down. The tourists were there to watch the gorillas eat, but it appears that they weren't being safe enough, and probably did something the gorilla interpreted as threatening or annoying. Anyway, the gorilla went back to eating once it felt everyone's respect. Given their size, strength, and intelligence, gorillas are certainly a force to be reckoned with. Although they don't attack that many people per year, estimates usually say around 10 people get very injured. That is not because they can't. With their strong arms and sharp teeth, they could easily take on any human in their territory. They are over 6 feet tall and up to 350 pounds, but that doesn't stop them from being able to move at around 32 kilometers per hour. What to do if you encounter one? What is your best option if you ever run into a gorilla? 
For starters, you should definitely not try to evade the situation by running. In fact, you should try to act as submissive as possible, helping them to feel dominant and that you have no intention of challenging the silverback status. I know it's hard, but stay calm. Gorillas actually see humans as one of them, so when they encounter one, they start to play a game of social hierarchy. Act like you're a gorilla. Don't look them in the eye and don't try to leave. Just look away at the ground, make yourself as small as possible, and look disinterested. Oh, this leaf is so pretty. Never show your teeth or raise your arms to look bigger, and definitely don't yell or thump your chest, even as a joke. If a gorilla decides to inspect you, just lay limp and you'll probably be okay. Lion The people of the Tsavo region in Africa are well aware that the lion is the king of the jungle. While construction workers were building the Kenya-Uganda Railway in 1898, two lions began their campaign of terror on the crew, taking the lives of around 135 people, according to some estimates. It is said that the Tsavo man-eaters ate every last bit of their prey, down to the bones, without leaving a trace. A hunter came to track down the beasts and sold them to the Field Museum in Chicago, where you can go see the man-eaters for yourself. The Tsavo man-eaters were probably more inclined to eating humans than your average lions due to the fact that it was a popular route at the time, and people who fell ill or were too weak to travel were left behind. Around 250 people die from lion attacks every year. I don't think I need to tell you to be careful around lions. They are huge cats and can run at up to 50 miles per hour. Their teeth can cut through flesh with ease. Plus, as you know, they run in packs. So if you ever find yourself facing a lion, you're likely facing a group of them. If you're traveling, hopefully you catch them while they're sleeping. They sleep up to 20 hours a day. Just like with gorillas, don't try to run away. If you turn your back on a lion, they will take that chance to spring on you. And you won't be able to run faster than them anyway. Usain Bolt, the world's fastest runner, can go 27 miles per hour, close to half of a lion's top speed. Instead, hold your ground, face them head on, put something over your head or wave your arms and walk backwards while making strange noises. This will make you appear intimidating and large. Venomous Snakes On a relaxing stroll back home from a party one evening, Kenyan woman Cheposite Adomo missed a pretty crucial feature of her environment, a six and a half foot black mamba. Before she knew it, the snake had wrapped around her legs and taken a bite, then another and another. Luckily, a man was coming along the path wielding a machete, saving her from the other two mambas lurking just out of sight. More people came over and tied pieces of cloth around her limbs to help stop the spread of the venom. They were able to take her to the hospital where she received the necessary anti-venom to survive. Black mambas are often considered some of the most dangerous, deadliest snakes in the world. About one million people are bitten by snakes every year in Africa alone, but only a fraction are thought to receive treatment. Huffington Post reports that globally, about five million people are bitten by snakes every year, with about 100,000 deaths and another 400,000 left permanently disabled or disfigured. Snakes can be found in most places around the world. The largest venomous snake is the king cobra, with enough venom to kill an Asian elephant. Measuring up to 18 feet long, this venomous snake commands respect. Sharp fangs can, upon incision, inject their venoms with incredibly powerful venom. The problem is that human encounters with snakes often happen because we don't see them in time. If you accidentally step on them, you might be in for a pretty nasty bite. What to do if you encounter one? First off, you don't want to encounter one. Most of the time, they will have the upper hand because you'll be right on top of them. One thing you can do is make some noise while walking around so that they know to move away and you don't end up stepping on them. Also, don't wear shorts in areas where there might be snakes. In long pants, their fangs are usually not able to make it all the way through. However, if you do get bitten, if you are not sure what kind of snake it was, get to the hospital immediately Try not to move and stay calm because if you panic, the venom will travel through your body faster. You should treat it as an emergency. Leave the snake alone and apply pressure to the wounded area. Contrary to popular belief, you are not supposed to wash, suck, cut, or tourniquet the bite. Have you ever had an encounter with a snake? What happened? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you are new here. I wanted to give a big shout out to Sadiq Ali and Grand101. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. Rhinos. While on safari at the Serengeti Park in northern Germany, onlookers watched in horror and awe as a giant 30-year-old rhino mashed his horn into the side of a car. This attack caused the car to flip over three times. While the car was heavily damaged, the park staff member locked inside left the vehicle relatively unscathed. 
No one is sure why the rhino was so heated. Rhinos are huge. White rhinos can weigh up to 5,100 pounds, even heavier than hippos, and they're faster than them as well. Rhinos can reach speeds of up to 35 miles per hour in just a few strides. It is extremely rare to be attacked by a rhino because they're extremely endangered, and only about two attacks happen per year. They are potentially dangerous, and if they feel threatened, they will prefer a fight. And you can see many compilations of rhino attacks, especially against vehicles, on YouTube. Levison Wood, an explorer and best-selling author who has visited over 100 countries, has had many face-to-face -face encounters with wild animals and remembers being charged by mother rhinos. I remember my heart hammering behind this tree and I couldn't see anyone, so there was this strangely lonely feeling. I waited there for about half an hour, and then finally I could hear a tracker calling us and we all kind of grouped together. My advice is you run if a rhino charges you. Make sure you're slightly fit and agile so you can. What to do if you encounter one? Like hippos, rhinos are inclined to charge at you in defense of their territory. When this happens, you should definitely try to run if you can. If there's a tree around, try to climb it or hide behind it. Some also suggest that you make strange noises like singing or chanting, as this might confuse the rhino and make it stop in its tracks. Crocodiles Near the end of World War II, Allied troops launched an attack to retake Ramri from the Japanese. As British troops pushed forward, it forced enemy combatants into the thick swamps around Ramri Island. Unknown to these men, the mangrove swamps are crowded with saltwater crocodiles. Of the 1,000 men who entered, only 400 came out alive. The survivors recounted that dozens of crocodiles had appeared from nowhere and dragged the helpless men to their doom. This event, while largely regarded as a story, holds the record for most number of fatalities in a crocodile attack in the Guinness Book of World Records. So you should definitely avoid these reptiles at all costs. National Geographic reports they can be up to 23 feet long and weigh up to 2,200 pounds. Yearly, they kill around 1,000 people. When they're ready to strike, they will do so without hesitation, moving at up to 19 miles per hour. Most attacks occur near or in the water when people are fishing or swimming. Nile and saltwater crocodiles are extremely dangerous to people, and Australia's saltwater crocodile has been named the world's most aggressive crocodile. However, the Nile crocodile is responsible for more attacks on humans than any other crocodilian species. After lions and hippos, the Nile crocodile causes the highest numbers of wildlife-related fatalities in Africa. Recently, there has been an increase in crocodile attacks in the Solomon Islands. The government has declared them out of control and is even considering lifting a 30-year ban on exporting their skin to control the population. What to do if you encounter one? If you've got to walk through an area where crocodiles may be present, try not to make any sudden movements. Splashing in the water and making lots of noise will only attract their attention. Crocodiles can wait for days to pounce on a decently sized meal, but if you avoid certain obvious locations like popular watering holes, then you might make it in the clear. If you do see a crocodile, back away slowly and if it runs after you on land, run in a straight line, don't zigzag, it won't help you. If you can't get away, aim for the eyes, and if it does grab you, don't stop fighting. Hippo. In the African country of Niger, students often take boats to cross the river and get to their school. But in 2014, while commuting to school in their boat across the Niger River in Nyaini, they were attacked by a raging hippopotamus. Thirteen perished in the accident when the hippo managed to flip the boat into the water. This is one of the worst hippo attacks in recent history. In Senegal, the Washington Post has reported that they have a killer hippo problem. When fisherman Ali Fall goes to work, he says he knows he is tempting death. He's been attacked by a hippo several times. The last time it flipped over his boat and bit him on both legs. Other friends of his haven't been so lucky. You might not think it at first glance, but hippos are some of the deadliest creatures in the world, and certainly the deadliest large creatures on the Nile. Native mostly to Sub-Saharan Africa, according to the BBC, these creatures take the lives of about 500 people per year in Africa. That's twice as many as lions, which is an estimated 250 annually. Although herbivores, they will often attack people who they take to be threats, especially if they have young hippos to protect. They are extremely aggressive and territorial and can weigh 3,500 to 9,920 pounds, according to the San Diego Zoo. With their gigantic jaws and sharp teeth, they can easily crunch up most animals, including crocodiles, in a single bite. Smithsonian reports that hippos have trampled or gored people who strayed too near, dragged them into lakes, tipped over their boats, and bitten off their heads. What to do if you encounter one? 
If you come across a hippo, try to hide somewhere up high. Given that they can run at about 19 miles per hour, outrunning them isn't much of an option. If there is a tree around, climbing it is your best bet, or at least try to hide. If you can't, try to find somewhere you can jump because that's something they can't do. If you are in the water, I hate to say this, but you might be out of luck. Bears. We go to national parks to relax, hike, and enjoy the scenery, but occasionally things go haywire. In 2011, grizzly bears killed two people at Yellowstone National Park. In fact, some experts suspect that both attacks might be credited to the same bear. The first was attacked while hiking with his wife, who was able to survive by playing dead. The second man was mauled just a month later, allegedly while trying to cut logs. These fatal attacks were the first in 25 years for the park. Bears can, of course, be very deadly creatures. Grizzlies can go up to 35 miles per hour and at up to 600 pounds, that makes for a heck of a lot of momentum if you find one charging at you. This combination of size, speed, and strength makes it nothing for most bears to overpower others. And with their strong teeth, they can latch onto flesh with ease. That is why you should take care when you go hiking. If a mother bear is protecting her young, then she is much more inclined to charge you in order to protect her cub. What to do if you encounter one? Luckily, most bear encounters do not lead to aggressive actions, nor even attacks. They are just as startled as you are. When in a bear's area, travel in groups and speak loudly so that they stay away in the first place. Get to higher ground if possible to make yourself look bigger. Carry bear spray for protection. If the bear is staying still, then move sideways slowly, keeping your eye on it as you move. This will help prevent you from tripping. Again, don't run or turn your back to it. They will chase you. If the bear follows you as you step away, just hold your ground. The National Park Service says that if you are attacked by a black bear, to never play dead, but to fight back with whatever you have. With brown bears and grizzlies, play dead. Thanks for watching. Have you ever faced a scary animal? What happened? What did you do? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe and click that notification bell. See you later. Bye.